Hello. Well, hello there to you, my friend, Ben Curtis. Hi there. Where you are. Are you in Prague? Well, my background is in Prague, though I confess that I am on an island in the Atlantic right now. <laughs> well, you could have just said it's a really, really big island that has yeah. um, really cool spires like exactly a, like a place that you know in the czech republic mm -hmm. but i want to let's just go ahead and welcome everybody here so hello everybody i'm trish feaster and this is my dear friend ben curtis as you know he is not only a guide and not only a professor and not only a consultant for ngos but he is a bona fide author and because of that, we have invited him to be our moderator for this month's book. Surprise, surprise, it's his book. It's his own book, The Habsburgs, The History of a Dynasty. So huge welcome to you, Ben. Thank you for being here today. It is my enormous pleasure. Thank you, uh, Trish, for being the hostess with the mostess. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in for this. It's my pleasure to get to talk a bit about this book that I wrote uh, and uh, lead us through the Guide Collective Book Club for this month. And of course, it is a total indulgence for me to get to dive deep into this family, the greatest family in European history, whom I spent entirely too many years studying so that I could write this book. And it's not that often, really, that you get like free license, carte blanche, just to geek out on something that you really know well. This is one of those rare times, so I'm just going to revel in it. Well, and I think that you should. We've got a lot of people who are following us right now on this live stream. Um, and if you're catching this on the replay, welcome to you as well. But hello to all of these people. I want to just give a quick shout out to some of the names that are popping up. So Jaleel is coming in all the way from Pakistan. So wow. thank you, Jaleel, for tuning in with us. Our colleague Fran is watching and he is in Spain, in Northern Spain, in Pamplona. Hi to Janet. And uh, so we've, we've got a bunch of people watching and um, what we're gonna do today is as the first Monday of the month, as we always do, we are going to be doing an introduction, not only into the book, but Ben is going to give a little bit, a little bit more in-depth history into the Habsburgs. Not a ton, because we've only got an hour, but this is going to prepare you for what's coming up for the rest of the month. If you haven't already gotten the book, you know that it is available on Amazon, of course. It's also on bookshop.org. It's on Barnes & Noble. If you can find it anywhere else, great, but it, it does take a little while to, to get into you, so make sure that you order that right away. And then throughout the month, we're going to have some other events and supplemental articles or even videos that Ben is going to put together to help enhance what you're learning. And then at the end of the month, the last Monday of the month, we are going to be doing a kind of group discussion wrap up, which is a private event via Zoom. And so the only way to get to be a part of that event is to join our Guide Collective Book Club. When you get a chance, if you haven't already joined, go to our website guide-collective.com. You'll find all the information there. And then all you have to do is just send an email to me uh, and you can send it to theguidecollective at gmail.com. Just tell me that you want to become a member and we will add you in. Now, let's turn it back over to Ben and so he can get us started on our introduction. Fantastic, thank you, Trish. Thank you everybody who is watching right now, listening right now, or maybe listening later, I really appreciate you spending some time uh, with us and to learn about this family that I learned about so much. Um, in a minute, I will start with a uh, sort of slideshow presentation. But before I get into that, let me just tell you what I'm going to do here uh, today. Um, the presentation is kind of an intro to the Habsburg dynasty. Uh, who they were, um, you know, where they ruled, why they're important, basically. A really kind of light overview. Um, we'll start off with some Habsburgs whom you've probably heard of. Like if, if the name Habsburg sort of means something to you, but you can't put any specific names to it, well, we'll go through some people I bet you have heard of that you will recognize. And there'll be a few whom I'll mention whom you maybe have never heard of, but are actually pretty interesting, I think. Um, and I might tell a juicy story or two about these couple Habsburgs I'll introduce. Um, 
I'll also look at a couple important Habsburg cities, just so you get a sense of where are we talking about? Where did this dynasty rule? And even show a map, just so you can get that in your head. Aha, that's Habsburg territory, right? Um, and then to finish up, I have some Habsburg fun facts. I'm doing, you know, you can see the, the air quotes, Habsburg fun facts. It's kind of- <laughs> You could only see like your left hand with this air quote and then the <laughs> right hand only had there one finger. So it was- Kind of, sort of uh, like, you know, you got to watch your punctuation. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but it's kind of the Habsburg fun facts are like sort of trivia stuff, but um, some things would actually that share, shed some light rather on the family and tell you a bit more about them beyond the interesting fun facts. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, and before we start, just a little bit more about me. Who am I? Trish uh, thankfully gave you a quick uh, quick overview of who you're going to be listening to for the next however long it takes, half an hour-ish. Um, so I did used to be a professor at Seattle University in the U.S., where I taught European history and politics. And I wrote this book while I was a professor there. And uh, the book was published 2013, so it goes back a ways now. I also work as a tour leader for Rick Steves and a guidebook researcher, too. And my home turf is the Habsburgs' home turf. So I lead tours mostly in kind of Central Europe. So uh, Germany, Czech Republic, Austria, uh, Hungary, Slovenia, Slovakia, Croatia, all that part of the world is uh, ground zero for the Habsburgs. And that's where I work and love and know. These days I live in Prague and you can see behind me that's, that is Prague in my, in my backdrop, even though I'm actually not there at this exact moment. Um, and I continue to, to uh, when, when there's tourism, I still lead tours. Uh, but apart from that, I do independent research projects for various non-governmental organizations and sometimes even governments. So, and I still write the occasional book. So that's me. Um, and again, thank you so much for being here. I am now gonna screen and uh, go here, let's see. Uh, I hope it's going to tell me if I get this. I want to share that tab. I want to share this tab. Um, Trish, do you see the? I can. And if you do, yeah, do that. And then we're going to Brilliant. see it full screen and it's perfect. Fantastic. Okay. There we go. Hopefully, this Huzzah. is all coming up. Um, if anybody has any troubles, I think maybe you can tell us in the chat. I don't know how that would work exactly, but. Um, but let us know, hopefully all goes smoothly from the technical side of things. So this, like I said, is an introduction to the Habsburg dynasty. This is my um, not super fancy uh, presentation with some images, just so you can kind of see that particular image there is the Habsburg coat of arms from the very end of the Habsburg monarchy. But let's start off with the Habsburgs themselves, the actual people, like who are we talking about? Who are the famous ones? If, for example, you heard the name Maria Theresa, or in German, Maria Theresia, might that ring a bell? I hope so. I hope that that sounds familiar, especially if you've traveled in Central Europe, you definitely would have heard of Maria Theresia. Here she is. Uh, she ruled from 1740 to 1780, so I always include the dates here, and those are the dates they ruled, not the dates that they lived. Uh, Maria Theresia, I think, is the greatest Habsburg of all time. She had 16 children, sometimes called the grandmother of Europe. She was a great reformer. She modernized the Habsburg monarchy. She's a fascinating transition from the Baroque period to the Enlightenment period there in the 18th century. And the Habsburgs, of course, had many powerful rulers before her and some important rulers after her. But there's a funny quote about Maria Theresia, which is attributed to the her contemporary, the, the Prussian king, Friedrich the Great. Uh, and Friedrich the Great said, the Habsburgs finally get a great man, and it turns out to be a woman. Because she was an incredible woman, an incredible person. Why do I think she's the greatest? Well, I talk about that in the book, and I'm not going to go into great detail on that right now. That's what, one reason I encourage you to join us for the book, book club, is so you can learn more about this greatest of all Habsburgs, why I think she's the greatest, and maybe form your own opinion. But I hope that the name Maria Theresia rings a bell for you, and that if you join us for the book club, you'll, you'll understand, aha, yes, 
she was an absolutely incredible leader. Now here's another Habsburg whom you might have heard of, Philip II, or in Spanish, Felipe II. And one admittedly quirky thing that I do is I use the versions of the names these people would have used for themselves. So it's not, I don't say Philip II because everybody I think can pronounce Felipe and that's how he was actually known. And again, his ruling dates there are 1556 to 1598. Now, if you have something in your mind about Felipe II, it might be pretty negative because he is often associated with the counter-reformation Spain, like this idea of the Spanish Inquisition burning heretics at the stake, or the Spanish Armada, which also happened under him in 1588. Um, it's this idea of this militaristic, aggressive, intolerant Spain trying to kind of crush Europe under its heel. And that's known as the Black Legend, the Black Legend of Spanish history. And here's one thing I want you to understand about that and about Habsburg history, is that the Black Legend is wrong. It is false. Felipe II was actually one of the most enlightened, smartest, most just rulers of his day. In fact, one of his nicknames in Spanish is El Rey Prudente, the, the prudent king. Um, and if you read the book, you'll come to understand, aha, many of the popular understandings of Felipe, they're just wrong. That in fact, real historical research shows uh, what an important and uh, again, prudent leader he was. Just one illustration right now, this portrait you see of him was by, as it says here, the Sofonispa Anguissola. Sofonispa Anguissola is one of the very few famous or important women painters of the Renaissance. So the fact that Felipe commissioned this portrait from a woman painter in a time when women painters didn't get much respect shows you that he wasn't just some kind of intolerant barbarian. There's actually much more to his story than is popularly known. This next person I'm going to show you was not technically a Habsburg, but you might know her because she's all over Vienna. If you've been to Vienna, you've seen probably this exact portrait all over. This is Empress Elizabeth. She's usually known as Sissi, which is her nickname. She was the wife of the guy I'll show you next. And she, as again, ruled from 1854 to 1898. She's a Habsburg by marriage. She's actually technically from the Wittelsbach dynasty. She grew up in Bavaria. But now she has been wrapped up in all of Habsburg history. She's famous as one of the most beautiful women of her time. I think you can see that in this portrait. She really was this glamorous, um, this like bewitching in so many ways. Uh, she was troubled. She's often compared to Princess Diana of more recent times. And that's a fair comparison because Sissy was trapped in a loveless marriage. Um, the royal duties she found unbearable. Uh, she had an eating disorder. She also had mental health issues in part caused by you know, the stress of being who she was. Um, and so she in some ways was the princess die of her day. And she's now kind of come down to us through Habsburg lore as this great doomed empress towards the very end of the 1800s. She was married to this guy, Hans Josef I. He outlived her, as you can see here. 1848 to 1916, he ruled. In fact, he is the longest ruling Habsburg, one of the longest ruling European or rulers in European history. 68 years. And this picture is from the last few years of his life. Obviously, you can tell it's a, a photograph. The funny thing is, though, that though he looks like an old fuddy-duddy sort of in this picture, he was always an old fuddy-duddy. He was a deeply conservative man. He lived in a time when there were cars and electricity and telephones. He didn't want any of those installed in his palace. There's a legend that he ate the same thing for dinner every night, Tafelspitz, like a kind of a pot roast. And if you go to Vienna, you can have like the emperor's pot roast and, and he had what he had. Um, but the thing about him is that he was actually not a bad ruler. He was dutiful. He was somewhat modest. In fact, on his tax return, he listed his job as self-employed civil servant. And you think of Sisi as sort of like the Princess Diana of her day, Franz Josef I was somewhat like or somewhat comparable to Queen Elizabeth of the UK right now, the current Queen Elizabeth. 
because he has lasted such a long time that it's hard to imagine for many people like who have lived in the UK or who have just any of us, even if we don't live in the UK, it's hard to imagine any other British monarch but Queen Elizabeth. And for people in the Habsburg Empire at this time, it was he lived so long and ruled so long, it was hard to imagine anyone else as their monarch. And in fact, he was the next to the last, because when he died in 1916, the next guy, Carl I, didn't last long. It was kind of the end. After him, everything fell apart. So Franz Josef I, he's, there's still a lot of nostalgia around him, and you often see him paired with Sissi, uh, his wife, in these nostalgic kind of recreations of Habsburg Vienna. Do you recognize this next guy? Whoa, probably not from this photo or from this picture, right? This is the Habsburg Emperor Rudolf II, except it's this crazy, wacky portrait of Rudolf II by Giuseppe Arcimboldo, and it's portrayed, he's portrayed as Vertumnus, which is like the god of the spring. So this is a Habsburg emperor made out of fruits and vegetables and flowers. This is what he actually looked like in his younger days. When he was older, he got kind of fat and, and, uh, and a little crazy. He also had some mental issues. Um, but he is a super interesting Habsburg ruler. If you've been to Prague, you've probably heard stories about Rudolf II because he's known as the wizard emperor. And that is because he made Cap Prague his capital and turned Prague Castle into this laboratory for alchemists and magicians of all sorts, people trying to turn base metals into gold, people trying to unlock the Hebrew Kabbalah and other mysteries of the universe. They were all there working at, for and paid for by Rudolf II. But Rudolf II also established one of the greatest art collections of his day. He had paintings, curiosities, rare artifacts brought from all over the world. One of the most amazing stories is he coveted this particular painting by Dürer, the great German Renaissance artist. Uh, and the, the painting happened to be in Vienna, in, excuse me, in Venice. Rudolf wanted it in Prague, so he hired people to carry it over the Alps and to carry it upright so that no damage would happen to it over the Alps because he wanted it for his collections. So he's this unusual, strange, brilliant, troubled uh, ruler who you can learn a lot more about in the book. There's a lot more stories to, to be told about him. But I want you to look at his face. Look at his face just for a second. Because when I show you this next Habsburg, you'll see some family resemblance. So I know this guy's face is a bit far away because it's not the, his face isn't the subject of this painting, but you can see some family resemblance. The jaw, this famous Habsburg jaw, because yeah, some Habsburgs had this, what's known as prognathism, where their jaw kind of sticks out. And both Rudolf had it a little bit and Charles V had it more pronounced. Even though you can't see it as much in this painting, I chose this painting because it gives you an idea of who Charles V was. He was the last great Western emperor. So in the tradition, not only of the Roman emperors, but particularly of Charlemagne, post-Roman empire, Charles V was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And he was the last one who was really powerful and whom Europe really looked to as kind of its leader. And this painting by Titian, of course, one of the greatest painters of his day, uh, Charles V had his portrait done by Titian. And the, the portrait expresses this because you see Charles V on horseback wearing gleaming military armor. And very specifically, this portrait was painted after a military victory over the Protestants. And it shows Charles V as the leader of Christendom, which he was because his empire was larger than any person's before that in European history, and he really bestrode the continent. He was the man who ruled more people and more lands than anyone else had for centuries. And hence, he is still the last great Western emperor because no one since him occupied that same um, position of authority. Now, speaking of the family resemblance between Rudolf II and Charles V, Charles V was Rudolf II's great-granduncle. No, no, speaking of family resemblance, 
There's some family resemblance in this next guy, Carlos II. Now, you've probably never heard of him unless you know your Spanish history. He's one of these lesser known Habsburgs, except you have heard of him in a way because Carlos II was the deeply inbred last Habsburg king of Spain. And this portrait, you can kind of see he's got a weird jaw. You can kind of see he's a little bit odd looking, but he's you know got this big wig on and he's kind of wrapped in his uh, fancy robes. In fact, he was much uglier than this. So the royal portraiture, this Wilhelm Huma, actually made him look good. This is as good as he could do to like make him look good. In fact, Carlos II was a deeply disabled individual, mentally disabled and physically disabled, because he was technically the result of what we could call incest, because his parents were both Habsburgs. Uh, and the Habsburgs are often famed or notorious for their inbreeding. Carlos II is uh, the poster child of that because he was so disabled. Now, the question is, why the inbreeding? People knew at the time that, for example, uncles shouldn't have children with their nieces, which happened within the Habsburg dynasty. People knew that was bad. In fact, the Habsburgs even had to get special dispensations from the Pope for some of their technically incestuous marriages. Why? Well, that's another thing that I talk about in the book. I encourage you to read it so that you understand why did the Habsburgs practice this inbreeding even though they knew it was problematic? Hmm. One of the mysteries that we can talk about in the book club. This next guy, I didn't put who he is yet because I wonder if anyone recognizes him. I guarantee even if you've had just high school European history, you've heard of him. So think about it for a second. Who is this guy? Who might he be? Well, it's a, it's a photograph, so it's relatively late. He's an archduke. Yes, he's Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He is the archduke who was assassinated in Sarajevo in June 1914, which essentially became the trigger for World War I. Um, the title archduke, interestingly, you probably only hear about it in terms of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, unless you dig further into the history. The Habsburgs were the only people who were ever archdukes. One of the funny stories is their original territories in Austria were not a kingdom, they were a dukedom. But the Habsburgs didn't like the idea of not being kings. They couldn't just name themselves kings because the Holy Roman Emperor at that time had to like approve you becoming a king. So they couldn't just name themselves kings. What they decided to do, in fact, one particular, Rudolf of the Habsburgs, said, okay, we can't call ourselves kings, so we're going to call ourselves archdukes. It's like, you know, an archbishop is to a bishop. Well, archdukes are to dukes. We're that much higher than all you other dukes. We're archdukes. And the Habsburgs were the only ones who ever called themselves archdukes. And this is the latter day's most famous archduke. I can tell you Franz Ferdinand was not a nice guy. I think you can kind of get that vibe from this photo. Like he's got this kind of military haircut and that totally outlandish mustache. He was not a likable human being. Um, and he only became the heir to the throne after the actual heir to the throne, the son of Franz Josef and Sisi, whose, whose portraits I showed you earlier, after he died in a murder suicide. There's a whole other juicy story to talk about at a later date. So Franz Ferdinand, whom you all have known, famous Habsburg, killed in Sarajevo in 1914. Here's another Habsburg who every single person listening to this knows. Who's this, do you think? Hmm, hmm, well, she's clearly earlier. It looks pretty 18th century to me. You know her name because this is Marie Antoinette. Her name is actually Maria Antonia. People think of her as French, but she is Austrian. She was a Habsburg. She was the wife of Louis XVI, famously beheaded in the French Revolution in 1792. So Marie Antoinette was one of Maria Theresia's 16 children. She was her eldest daughter. And it's a pretty interesting story how she ended up marrying the King of France because historically, France was the main en enemy for the Habsburgs. Like they had wars and wars and wars over centuries. So why then 
did Maria Theresia, this incredibly smart leader, marry her daughter to the French king? It has to do with the, what's known as the reversal of alliances. When suddenly, in the later 1700s, the Habsburgs ally with France. That was a, an incredible revolution in European statecraft and diplomacy before like the French Revolution, which turned everything upside down again. But the fact that this Habsburg empress would marry her daughter, the French king, was incredible for the time. Um, one other funny little story about this particular portrait. This is, this is funny, but also frankly, kind of creepy for us today. Maria Theresia, uh, excuse me, Marie Antoinette was 13 when this portrait was painted. It was painted as like the, the uh, picture for her future husband of the girl he was going to be marrying. So I don't know what you, this is like the Tinder photo or something of the day for Marie Antoinette. Pretty weird, huh? Now this next guy, there's another French connection here. See if you know who he is. I bet you've seen his this portrait before if you have been to Paris, if you've been to Versailles in particular, and I know you know his name because this is Louis XIV of France. Now, he's not technically a Habsburg because these things are patrilineal in European history, meaning the bloodline goes to the father. But guess what? Louis XIV, his mother was a Habsburg and his first wife was also a Habsburg. Now, the point of this is to tell you that the Habsburgs, their fingerprints are everywhere in European history. Literally, they have an influence in almost every contemporary European country. In fact, here's a map. Here's a map from the book, which shows you the Habsburg domains around 1700 with a little bit of time fudge. But what do you see here? Everything that's white is not Habsburg, but look at how much that's either black or gray. The Habsburgs ruled almost all of Europe in the later 1600s. It's pretty incredible. Also think about it like this, look at France. You can understand why France was historically kind of the main enemy of the Habsburgs because the French were almost surrounded by Habsburg territories whether it's in the Iberian Peninsula and in, in Spain, Castilla and Aragon, or whether it's the Netherlands and what's now Belgium, whether it's the Holy Roman Empire, whether it's the Danubian domains over there in Austria and Bohemia. And of course, the Habsburgs even ruled big chunks of Italy at this time. So this just gives you an idea of when we talk about the Habsburgs kind of footprint in Europe, where is it? It's almost everywhere. Some of this was only Kind of titular sovereignty. So you see how the Holy Roman Empire is kind of shaded there. The, Holy, the Habsburgs were the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, but that didn't always translate to being able to call the shots. In some places they lost, so they lost Portugal in 1640. Uh, but just before that, in the reign of uh, Felipe IV of Spain, the Habsburgs effectively controlled all of South America, What's today Mexico and much of the southwestern USA? What's today the Philippines? Chunks of Asia and colonies scattered all around Africa, in addition to all of this stuff in Europe. One reason why the Habsburgs are so important is because they had the first global empire on which the sun never set. And one of the things the book talks about is how did they put this empire together? How did it happen? It's an absolutely incredible story. So with this geography kind of overview, we can zoom in on some famous Habsburg cities. Vienna today is probably the most famous Habsburg city. And I chose this particular image because you actually see some of the Habsburg palaces, right? I don't know if you can, probably can't see my cursor necessarily, but down in the lower right, is a part of the Hofburg, which is like the Habsburgs palace, their main palace in Vienna. But then you go just to the left and you see this great plaza surrounded by these two imposing buildings. That's the Art History Museum and the Natural History Museum built during Franz Josef's time. And then you go up towards oh, there's all those green areas. You see just kind of above the, the Natural History Museum, you see this other complex, which is the parliament today. And then just above that, you see the beautiful town hall, and across the town, across the green space from the town hall, you see the Burgtheater, which is the most prestigious theater. So this actually shows us what's known as the ring 
in Vienna, the Ring Road, which is this uh, just parade of amazing architecture built after the Habsburgs tore down Vienna's city walls in the later 1800s. If you've been to Vienna, you know the Habsburgs are there, right? Because you can't talk about Vienna without the Habsburgs. So, of course, they go together with Vienna, but they also go together with Prague. And if you've been to Prague, not only have you seen this amazing site, but you've also heard a lot about the Habsburgs because Prague Castle up there in kind of the background, that was one of the Habsburgs' foremost palaces. And in fact, as I said, that was the capital of the whole Holy Roman Empire during Rudolf II's reign. That's where it all went down. So Prague, this classic Central European city, definitely Habsburg territory, as is Budapest, the other Danubian city. So if you just sail down the Danube a little ways, you'll end up in Budapest. And people often think of the Habsburg domains, they call it Austria-Hungary. Well, technically, Austria-Hungary didn't come into existence until 1867. But after 1867, Budapest was the twin capital, along with Vienna, of the Habsburg monarchy. And even though Vienna didn't, didn't come through World War II as, as pristine as Prague did, and was never as quite a, an important city in earlier days as Prague was, there's still lots of beautiful architecture. And you can see just from this very view, looking across the Danube at, at Buda Castle, you get an idea of this majesty that Budapest had as one of the twin capitals of Austria-Hungary. Now, we couldn't leave out Madrid, the capital of Spain, also one of the capitals of the Habsburg monarchy. In fact, Spain is the capital, uh, excuse me, Madrid is the capital of Spain today because of the Habsburgs, because Felipe II, Felipe Philip II, chose Madrid as the capital of his Iberian realms because it was roughly central in the Iberian Peninsula. So Madrid is the capital, not only of the Habsburg Spain, but it's actually the capital of Spain because of the Habsburgs. So Vienna, Prague, Budapest, Madrid, those are probably the three most famous cities with a lot of Habsburg heritage. But there's a couple other cities that you might not know are actually Habsburg cities. How about Bruges? Yeah, the Habsburgs uh, ruled Bruges for about 300 years, starting from the, the very end of its medieval golden age, so just prior to 1500 to 1794. So Bruges is actually partly a Habsburg city. Trieste. You might think of Trieste, oh, it's Italy, right? Well, it is now, but it actually belonged to the Habsburgs. It was considered Austrian territory from 1382 all the way to 1918. And one reason I love Trieste is it still feels like a mixture of Italy and Austria. And here's a funny little one, Luxembourg, that, that forgotten kind of little country right up there by Belgium and the Netherlands. It also belonged to the Habsburgs for about 300 years, the 1470s to 1795. And after that, the French Revolution changed things. But the Habsburgs ruled here for centuries. Why is there even a Luxembourg, such a tiny, insignificant country today? Well, that's also partly because of the Habsburgs. And I'll get to that story in the fun facts. So let's talk about some Habsburg fun facts. First of all, I mentioned the Holy Roman Empire. The family ruled the Holy Roman Empire from 1438 until 1806 with only one little break in between. This is absolutely unrivaled in European history. There's no other dynasty that comes even remotely close to this. And the Holy Roman Empire, as I was alluding to talking about Charles V, was the highest crown of the West. It was the most prestigious crown, the most prestigious title in in the West, in Europe. Uh, and this is a big reason why there was no more dynasty or no dynasty with greater prestige than the Habsburgs, because they essentially owned the crown of the Holy Roman Empire for centuries. Another fun fact, this saying attributed or about the Habsburgs, let others wage war, you, happy Austria, marry. What does this mean? This is something that actually runs through Habsburg history, this saying. What does it mean? Well, the idea is that the Habsburgs didn't gain their empire so much from fighting wars, unlike, say, Louis XIV, who added to French territory mostly through wars. The French got it, excuse me, the Habsburgs got it rather through marriage. And just one key example the Habsburg ruler Maximilian I, in the last couple of decades, 
uh, of the 1400s. He put together two marital alliances that are unprecedented in European history. Because in the space of about one generation, the Habsburgs, who had been Holy Roman emperors and who had been Archdukes of Austria, suddenly also became the kings of Castile and Leon in the Iberian Peninsula and inherited thus all of Castile's enormous empire in the New World. And they gained the crowns of Bohemia and Hungary in Central Europe. All of this all at once, and suddenly you have the Habsburgs controlling so much of Europe, like in that map that I showed you. And in the generation just after Maximilian I, in Charles V's generation, in the early 1500s, all six brothers and sisters were kings and queens. This is also something that has never happened before or since in European history. This is an example. Charles was Holy Roman Emperor and, of course, uh, king of Castile and Aragon in Spain. His brother, Ferdinand, was subsequently Habsburg, or Holy Roman Emperor and ruled Bohemia, Hungary, and Austria. Their sister, Maria, was an earlier queen of Hungary and Bohemia. Their sister, Eleanor, was queen of Portugal and later queen of France. Their sister, Isabel, was queen of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And their sister, sister Queen Catalina, was queen of Portugal. So this generation, nobody has ever topped them in terms of the number of crowns that they wore. Another fun fact, 1683, the battle that saved civilization. What is this about? You may have heard this story once before. In 1683, the Ottoman Turks besieged Vienna. They tried several times before. This time, they almost got it until an army put together of a couple of different Central European powers swooped down at the last minute and decimated the Ottoman armies. And it's called the battle that saved civilization because the Ottomans came very close to taking Vienna at that point. And there's all sorts of what ifs. If the Ottomans had succeeded in taking Vienna in 1683, it's reasonable to guess that maybe a large portion of the population of Central and Southeastern Europe today might actually be Muslim. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just would have been an incredible turning point in history. It was an incredible turning point in history. This battle that saved civilization, that turned the tides against the Ottomans, who never again threatened Central Europe in the way that they had in the previous centuries. There's a great, a great quote by the British historian A.J.P. Taylor. In most countries, dynasties are episodes in the history of the people. In the Habsburg lands, peoples are complications in the history of the dynasty. What does this mean? Well, the history of most of Eastern Central Europe actually revolves around the dynasty. You can't talk about, well, you could, I suppose you could, but it's extremely difficult to talk about Czech history without talking about the Habsburgs. Same Austrians, same Hungarians, same Slovenians, same Croatians, same S Polish, same Romanians, same Serbians, right? Even the same for Northern Italy. Sometimes there's actually, these places didn't even exist as kingdoms or as states until the Habsburgs took them over. And so the Habsburgs actually are the thread that ties together so much of Central European history that you really cannot understand that history without understanding what the dynasty did. More fun facts. Vienna has been called the city where the 20th century was invented. Because when you looked at that, those latter days of the Habsburg Empire, right around 1900, the list of names of people who were active in art, in science, in architecture, in all kinds of uh, domains was absolutely incredible. Just for example, you have Sigmund Freud, who created psychoanalysis and changed our understanding of the human mind. You have Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele, these two great expressionist painters who also overturned earlier ideas of what beauty and art looked like. You had composers such as Schoenberg, who cast away the old tonal structures of Western art music. You have Gustav Mahler, another composer whose symphonies totally blew up the, modal, the mode for a symphony. You have architects like Otto Wagner, 
who did away with old forms of ornamentation. You have playwrights and writers like Otto Schnitzler and Stefan Zweig. You have philosophers like Ludwig Wittgenstein and scientists like Karl Popper. These people changed our understanding of humanity and changed the course of cultural history for the 20th century. Another fascinating fact about this amazing fusion of creativity in Vienna around 1900, many of the greatest artists, writers, scientists were Jewish. And it's a pretty fascinating insight into the multicultural melting pot that Vienna was at that time. Another quote from a historian, this is the 19th century uh, Czech historian, Franciszek Palacki. He said, if Austria did not exist, it would be necessary to invent her. What he meant was that you have these smaller peoples there in Central Europe who are not big enough to kind of make their own realm, right? There's not enough Czechs to be able to compete with the French. There's not enough Hungarians to be able to compete with the Germans or the British. So the Habsburgs became a home for all these smaller peoples. The Czechs, the Slovaks, the Hungarians, the Slovenians, the Croatians, they overarched them. And you needed to, he, the idea is that you had to invent Austria because it, the Habsburgs fulfilled an important purpose. They made a state in Central Europe that helped balance the power in Central Europe. And if you want to think about how important that balance of power was, think about what happened in European history once the Habsburg monarchy was gone. Because then in the 20th century, you get Hitler and Stalin moving into that power vacuum where the Habsburgs once were. It's really not too, uh, it's not fanciful to make that what if. That if the Habsburg monarchy hadn't been broken up at the end of World War I, you might never have had uh, either the Nazi regime or the 40 years of Soviet domination of Eastern Central Europe. Pretty fascinating to think about that kind of stuff. So just as the Habsburgs became a home for these smaller peoples, it's also a fair argument that the Habsburgs are the reason that Belgium, Austria, and Luxembourg exist. Austria, of course. I mean, the reason why Austria exists as a state today is because of the Habsburgs. Why didn't it just become part of Germany? Well, because it belonged to the Habsburgs. It belonged to a different dynasty, and the Habsburgs uh, didn't or couldn't join Germany. Belgium? You ever thought about that? Why is there a Belgium? It's this country that kind of barely hangs together, where the northern half speaks a form of Dutch and the southern half speaks French. And they're always fighting about, like, why are we even in the same country? Well, it's because the, Habs the Habsburgs controlled what's today Belgium for hundreds of years. And uh, they, it was a good solution at the time because the balance of power didn't want Belgium either going to France or going to the Netherlands. So they let the Habsburgs keep it. And you have this state which comes together as this kind of you know, weird hybrid of these two different peoples. And it's still around because people couldn't think of anything else to do with it. So there's like this footprint that the Habsburgs created in Austria and Belgium that's just still filled by those countries. And Luxembourg is kind of the same. There was another dynasty once in Luxembourg, but it was this area controlled by the Habsburgs. They didn't ever try to integrate it into some larger state. They didn't try to make it part of their, of like what's Belgium. They didn't attach it to the things they held in Germany. It kind of existed because the Habsburgs let it exist. And then once the Habsburgs were gone, Luxembourg just kind of kept existing. And so in a weird way, the Habsburgs are one of the reasons why you have some of these weird European countries, like these little small kind of quirky European countries like Luxembourg especially, but even Belgium. And our last fun fact, the Habsburgs, oh yeah, they're still around. The head of the Habsburg family, you can't really call it a dynasty now because they don't rule anything, but you, the head of the Habsburg family now is a guy named Karl von Habsburg. He is the son of Otto von Habsburg. And Otto von Habsburg is important because he was the, the last Habsburg crown prince, that if there had still been a throne after World War I, he would have eventually sat upon the throne. But Otto von Habsburg died and his son, Karl, took over. Karl is 60 years old. He actually lives in Salzburg in Austria. He was a member of European Parliament. He was also a quiz show host in Austria for a while. He uh, works mostly as an advocate to protect important cultural properties, like in military conflicts, so kind of monuments men stuff, protect great art from being damaged in war. Uh, and when he's gone, his son will take over. 
Um, his, his son is a Formula One driver, because I guess that's what you do if you're really, really rich and don't have anything else to do is you drive race cars. I want to tell you the name of this future head of the Habsburg family because it makes me laugh because it's this classic European aristocratic name that takes like a paragraph. The eventual head of the Habsburg family is named Ferdinand Zvonimir Maria Baltus Keith Michael Otto Antal Barnum Leonhard von Habsburg Lothringen. That's his full name. I like the fact that Keith is in there for some reason. I don't know. Um, but so that's the Habsburgs, who are the two guys who are currently kind of tops of the family. So we're almost done. Thank you so much for your interest in listening. Let me tell you just a little bit about the book before I wrap it up. Um, this book and kind of how I came to write it. So I was working as a tour guide, as I said, in, in Habsburg lands and was, of course, talking about them and how important they are to the history. And people would say, Ben, can you recommend a book about the Habsburgs? And there wasn't really one that I thought was very good that I could recommend. Like, it was easy to read, that it was engaging. It was both the Spanish and the Austrian Habsburgs. There were some books, but I didn't think they were that great. So finally, it just occurred to me, I guess I got to write that book. I'd written a few books beforehand and, and just took this project on and said, okay, I'm going to be the guy to write that book. Um, and the book that came out of it, it was the publisher asked for it to be academic trade. This is a little bit of the inside baseball of, of I guess, the publishing business, but academic trade, which means this needs to be a scholarly work, but it needs to be readable by anybody. Like you don't have to have a PhD to understand it. Funnily enough, I'd, I'd already started working on the book when the publisher was acquired by a bigger, bigger publisher that said, and, okay, Ben, actually, we want it to be more academic than trade. So kind of before I fully started writing, the book, I guess, got a bit more scholarly. Um, the reason I say this is because I want you to understand that it's, it's not primarily a narrative history like something, I don't know what, Stephen F. Ambrose might have written if you've written, if you've read Stephen F. Ambrose stuff or Timothy Egan kind of stuff. Like it's not, it's not just stories. Like it is more analytical. It is more academic. And I just reread it for the first time since I wrote it um, in the past couple of weeks. And I will admit it's pretty dense. So I'm telling you this because it's not that fluffy, right? Like it's a pretty, it's a pretty serious book uh, and more analytical. Um, if you decide to join the book club and, and read the book, and you find like the analytical stuff is maybe too dense for you, kind of the first two thirds of every chapter are more narrative, right? They're just kind of telling the story of that period. Um, but what I wanted to do with the book is yes, tell the story of the Habsburgs, but in particular is to look at the, fa the Habsburg family business. And the Habsburg family business was ruling, was basically governing, right? So essentially, the book talks about how this family managed to stay in power for around seven centuries, something no other European dynasty was ever able to accomplish at this level, how they managed to stay in power, and then how they wielded that power for that much time. And so there's a lot of stuff in the book about like what is kingship in European history? What does royal governance look like in European countries, and how does it change over time? And even if that stuff might be pretty in-depth for you, one of the things I hope the book does do well is that it's a, also, I think, a pretty good overview of many of the main trends in European politics and culture from the Middle Ages right up until the early 20th century. Because the Habsburgs, as I said, their fingerprints are all over European history. And by studying the Habsburg history, you actually learn a lot about broader European history. What was the Thirty Years' War? Uh-huh. Turns out the Thirty Years' War was in many ways a war of everybody against the Habsburgs. Um, why was World War I fought? Well, turns out that's partly because of the Habsburgs. What was the Baroque? Well, let's look at and understand the Baroque through the lens of the Habsburgs. So um, I hope that um, those big, long lines of European history come a bit clearer just by looking at them through the family. And that is what we'll be looking at for the 
book club. I can tell you, Trish mentioned um, a couple of the things we have coming up, and I'll just kind of preview those. So in addition to the very end of the month, our discussion, uh, later this week, we'll have a post on my favorite Habsburg palaces. So if you want to go, if you want to play House Hunters International with Habsburg palaces, check out this post and you will see what I think are some of the coolest, most amazing castles and palaces the Habsburgs lived in. I'll also do a post on like how to learn more about the Habsburgs through some really cool websites or some movies, because of course the Habsburgs, there have been movies about them, fiction stuff, but also nonfiction. And there's like lots of novels and other great books around the Habsburgs. So I'll do a post on that. And then another fun one, I hope it's fun, I'll do a talk also later on in the month about Habsburg treasures, which is my pick of some of the greatest works of art and architecture that happened under the Habsburg dynasty. And you can imagine for a family that ruled so long in so many incredible places, there are some absolutely, absolutely fantastic works of art and architecture that classify as Habsburg treasures. So that's the preview. Uh, thank you again for your interest. I hope that you may decide to join us for the book club. And I am super excited for the discussion and to help teach and also learn from you about what you find interesting about this most important dynasty in European history. Holy cow, Ben, you just like hit it out of the park. You're so rad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so entertaining. And, oh, you know, man. I mean, we're, it's, it's what, what I found really interesting, and there were so many things, but something that you mentioned towards the end is that being able to understand the Habsburgs gives you a much deeper insight into understanding European history overall. And a lot of our colleagues kind of use this imagery where we talk, when we teach, when we teach about history or um, to view it as a kind of tapestry, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about all of the threads, all of the pieces of fabric that have been interwoven because of the Habsburgs, and then pulled each of those things, you'd be left with virtually nothing, right? <laughs> right. You'd be like, yeah. uh, I, I don't know what this is. Yeah, <laughs> because exactly. it's, just, it's just tatters because they were so integral. So being able to have this is going to enhance all of our explorations. And when we are finally able to get back to Europe and travel around, all of these things are gonna take on a whole new dimension, a whole new level of uh, depth, and understanding. So I'm really excited that you as the author are able to guide us through this during this entire month, not only with the book itself, not only with the group discussion at the end, but also the supplemental work that you're gonna be doing to help us further our knowledge of this. So Ben, huge thanks to you for that. Thank you, it is my pleasure. Thank you, Trish, for, for helping make this whole thing go. And, I'm, and thank you again to everyone who who's interested, who's listening now or later, and who might join us for the book club, it will be an enormous pleasure to get to go through this uh, material with you. And just so that everybody understands that this is, I mean, as much as Ben is contributing all of this work, and he is, right, he's putting a ton of effort into this um, to, to create the multiple supplemental things that he's doing, but also to moderate this, but it does not mean that it is a one-way street, right? As a book club, we're all engaged in this. Um, we want you to participate. And in fact, we're carrying over something that we started last month with Nina Sefusati, who was our moderator last month for The Water of the Hills. But we've created a Google spreadsheet, Google Doc, where you can submit your own questions or your own reflections and responses to something. You know, if something sticks out to you and you're like, well, hey, why did this happen? Or, you know, this wasn't clear to me. Can you explain this? Or if there's a theme that you think, hey, this is going to be a really um, kind of a potent topic to talk about at our group discussion, we want you to share that with us. It'll give Ben throughout the month some ideas of how he wants to shape that group discussion in terms of managing our time and how we're going to focus on those things. And in addition to that, Ben is actually going to put his own questions in there for you to help guide you along the process. So um, we hope that this encourages everybody to be more interactive and we want this to be a community of readers, a community of learners, a community of travelers who can travel through literature and through history and text um, to be able to come together and expand their knowledge. So please make sure if you have not already joined Guide Collective Book Club, all you have to do is you're gonna email me at theguidecollective at gmail.com 
and you just say something like, hey, Trish, can I be a member? And I will say yes, and I add you to the list. And then you're going to get all of the links, you're going to get all of the updates, all of that information. And if you are just curious about it, you're like, eh, should I, should I not? You can read about it more on our website. If you go to guide-collective.com, you'll find our Guide Collective Book Club page. It'll tell you about this month's read. Um, pretty soon we're gonna put up what's going to be our May read. Jorge, who is joining us today, is going to be the moderator for that. And we'll be taking a trip across Northern Spain doing the Santiago de Compostela. Um, so there's lots of really great activities that we have lined up for you. And again, don't miss any of Ben's extra posts. We've got one this week one every week throughout the, the rest of the month of April. And Ben, before we go, there mm. were a couple of questions that came up that I, I don't want to miss out on. And know that if you have submitted questions or if you're watching this as a replay, you can still submit questions. We'll keep coming back to this and Ben and I will respond. Well, Ben will because he's the expert on that, but um, we'll make sure that we, these things get addressed. But a couple of questions that came up, one was from Joyce, who is a really avid follower of ours. And she says, could you shed some light on the difference in the spelling of Habsburg mm. and Habsburg? Yeah, so you sometimes see it spelled in English with the P, H-A-P-S-B-U-R-G, uh, and that's just wrong, right? Like that's that spelling has come down to us because that's sort of the pronunciation, the proper pronunciation in German is Habsburg, where it kind of sounds like P, like a P, but in fact, the, the proper spelling as the Habsburg spelled it themselves is with a B, H-A-B. So my, encour my encouragement to everybody is forget that H-A-P stuff, that's wrong, go H-A-B. Thank you for that. And our colleague Nina, is, she made a remark, not quite a question, but it is a, a, a poignant remark to say, interesting how small countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Norway still have each of their monarchies. No chopping off the heads, no violent revolutions or assassinations. Um, and I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to speak to that obviously in the book, but I thought that was interesting that she mm. mentioned. Yeah. Or you can speak to it now. Right. No, I, it's, I'm going to say it's because you you small northern countries in particular, uh, you, you just got your act together, right? Forget this chopping off head stuff. Let's just, you know, let's all get along here. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, sort of, but not entirely. So, I mean, really, we could have just, we could have been really reductionist and said, make love, not war. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like, the, like the Habsburgs, right? Like marry, okay. don't make war, marry. Yeah, make a baby. Exactly. I mean, not, not with your uncle, please. Stop preferably, doing that. Yeah, preferably not. Stop yeah. it. Stop mm -hmm. it. But exactly. make a baby. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Laura says, this has been so good. I wish Ben had been one of my professors in college. I know me too. Me too. But he's too young to have been that. So uh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as you can hopefully tell, I do love teaching and this is a great opportunity to get to teach about something that I know a fair bit about. So, so it's a real pleasure. Sarah is watching and she says, you kept both me and Luca fascinated for the whole broadcast. So you know that you guys know Sarah Murdoch, her son, Luca is in high school and he is an avid, avid fan of history. And particularly he really, um, he gravitates to World War I, World War II mm -hmm. and all of that stuff leading up to it. So I'm glad that, um, you know, that we're be able to, you particularly are able to communicate across generations and to be able to share this knowledge with all of us. And then Jaleel, who we know is in Pakistan. Hi, Jaleel. He says, it's a great effort on part of the author. I think after reading the book, we might come to the point that what was so important regarding this dynasty. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. um, I, and it, it, I think it's interesting too, Ben, as you were talking, I was thinking about just very recent events, um, thinking about the intrigue of the Habsburgs and all of this, you know, like, uh, even though it was more make love, not war kind of thing, mm -hmm. there still are machinations, you know, there's still totally. planning and all of that stuff. And when we think about what's happening in Jordan right oh, now, yeah. the royal family, it's um, it's going to be interesting for all of us as we're reading to, to maybe intentionally, unintentionally make those parallels. Yeah, I'll be fascinated to see what parallels you make. Um, and we can talk about that because that's also my hope is like the Habsburgs, their centuries of history definitely have lessons for us for the 21st century. And their model even 
they're sometimes called a forerunner of the European Union, right? Like, so there's all this stuff that's just totally relevant today, which I would, would love to be able to talk about. And then just as a last kind of wrap up, okay, uh, two last things, actually, Osa, another one of our colleagues, and she is in mm -hmm. Sweden, she says, we were quite good at chopping royal heads off in Scandinavia oh. too, but okay. for the last 200 years, we are getting better along and things have been calmer. Well, yay, yay for good. progress. Progress, exactly. <laughs> And then to just if you guys cannot get enough of all of this, because how could you get enough of the Habsburgs? Um, Patricia reminds us that um, Rick, Rick Steves actually did an episode just early, I think it was this week on Monday, where he did Monday Night Travels and he did Vienna with um, my uh -huh. friend Samantha Brown. You guys know uh -huh. her from her TV shows, plural, um, on the Travel Channel. So if you want to increase your knowledge, you can go back and watch that. And then if you didn't know this, before Ben came on this morning with me, he was actually on another show. Huh. He was on <laughs> Adventures with Sarah, with Sarah Murdoch, mm -hmm. where they were talking about the Danube. So there's even more information for you. So we're just, we're putting it out there. We want you to learn. This is all about us connecting, building community and increasing our awareness of, of history and making those contemporary parallels so that we can become better global citizens. Absolutely, well favorite. said, well said. <laughs> and with that, we're going to wrap up. Uh, again, if you want to put in more comments, great. We'll check those a bit later. And you know all the details. You can find all of that on our website, guide-collective.com. And we will catch you very soon. Thank you again, Ben. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.